and uh, we'll dive into the the actual material. But that was a bit of a preface um, for what we'll be covering today, where we're going, and uh, why it's important from the broader perspective and of nonlinearity in models, um, uh, because it, it has these profound implications across uh, multiple concerns in modeling. So uh, I'm going to uh, end the insult of uh, needing to uh, uh, see my face and we'll switch over to slides here. I have had to change slide technologies because of the uh, high amounts of, um, of mathematical content here. The, uh, the previous uh, material was, uh, was awkward to present in, in the system I was using, PowerPoint Online. So I've switched over to Google Slides and hopefully um, the gods will smile upon us uh, today. Um, okay, so last time we had defined uh, elements of the basics of uh, infectious disease modeling or communicable disease modeling. Um, and we defined a set of parameters uh, associated with this that are foundational. One was the, if we consider a, a given uh, susceptible, um, uh, equally much so a given infective, we ask how many contacts do they have per unit time? Let's say 20, 20 contacts per month. We also had a beta term. This is sort of a canonized name, which is a per discordant contact probability of transmission. There's a lot of words there. Basically what it means is if a susceptible and infective come into contact, what's the probability that the infective will transmit that bug to the susceptible uh, in that uh, because of that occurrence of contact. So it might be you know one percent chance uh, for some bugs, and it might be you know a fifty percent chance for others. Watch out for those strains, ladies and gentlemen. They have much higher beta. About uh, fifty. Uh, I saw a paper today um, could be up to seventy. 70 some odd percent more than the conventional strain. Uh, the, there's a good bet it's, it's 50% or more. Um, okay, so uh, we talked last time about some of the core terms and one of the, the absolutely most important and one we report daily to stakeholders across Canada is the force of infection. Um, and that's defined here. And uh, it reflects the fact, look, if I have, let's say a hundred contacts with anyone each day, maybe only a fraction of those. So if I'm a susceptible and I have a hundred contacts with anyone, perhaps only 50% of the entire population. So I over N is 0.5 of, uh, of those contacts tend to be with, with infectives. So of my hundred contacts per day, 50 per day are with infectives. And for each of those, I have a beta chance of transmission. And we approximated this being the, as the chance, uh, uh, chance per, per, uh, uh, per unit time that I'm going to get infective as a, as a uh, get infected as a susceptible, okay? Um, and we saw that this fed directly into here but we have to multiply it by uh, susceptibles. So this force of infection is multiplied by susceptibles to yield this, this term here, which is the total number of susceptibles infected per unit time. And that's exactly what this flow is. Um, and this, this formula is just enshrined in, um, in mathematical epidemiology, it's the single most common uh, formula other than first order delays you'll, you'll see in these uh, differential equations. And I noted that it could be viewed from the perspective of an infective, um, in which case we start reasoning about their number of people that they infect per unit time. And that brings us to the uh, effective reproductive number and the, um, uh, and as well as the, um, the basic reproductive number. Um, I noted the fraction susceptible says critical throttle um, uh, on, on the uh, spread of infection. And that if you, know, uh, you have 50% of the population being susceptible around each infective compared to 100%, it leads them to infect on average you know, half the number of people per unit time. Um, and you know, more, 
more at, at a more uh, deeper level of deeper intuition, a fraction susceptible um, uh, is can be analogized to sort of being how much fuel is av uh, available for the fire or the it, how much of it is is easily accessible by the fire right now. And the number of susceptibles out there is kind of the unburnt wood. It's the the wood that can still still be burnt. If if there's very few susceptibles, it's like uh, you've got a fire in the fireplace that has no new wood to burn. It just is not going to be able to continue. Uh, there may be embers that um, burn hot and burn slow, but um, they won't be uh, uh, they won't be catching um, uh, new new flames onto new substances as long as there's no new fuel. Um, and uh, and I had noted in my preface remarks this uh, effective reproductive number indicated with R star or R of T or ERN for effective reproductive number and the basic reprodu uh, reproductive number uh, R naught. Okay. Now uh, I should have a formula for it here, and I'm, I'm surprised I'm not seeing that. And I'm wondering, oh, mumble. Um, okay. Now, now I'm really in. Um, in trouble. I want to get out of this preview mode. Um, but uh, I should have had a formula for it right there. The formula is very simple. Uh, I was hoping it would appear in the slides, but I see that it doesn't. Um, so uh, I'll just tell you what the formula is in this for this simple case. Um, if we think about the number of susceptibles infected per unit time by for each infective, that's this thing here. Okay, uh, it's 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 um, uh, it's it's this one here. S or sorry, C times S over N times beta is the number of susceptibles infected infected per unit time by each infective. Let's go through the reasoning again. I'm an infective. I have contact with 100 people, let's suppose, per day. Of those, suppose 50% are susceptible. Then I have contact with 50 susceptible people per day. And each of those, I have a 1% chance of transmitting infection to. So I have, I have about 0.5 people per day that I infect. But that's not yet these quantities. These quantities ask over the entire course of my illness, how many people I'm, am I going to infect? And so if we multiply that by the length of my illness, let's say call it tau, the average duration of infectiousness, that will give the effective reproductive number. The basic reproductive number is the same thing, except we assume S equals N. Everyone is, is susceptible. And we ask, how many people can I possibly infect over the entire course? Well, can I, do I infect on average over the course of my illness? That would be C times, well, one, S equals N, times beta and times the duration that I'm infectious, let's say tau. So it'll be C beta tau. And we're going to see that writ large in a few minutes in some of the formulas that pop out of those more textured cases, OK? So that's the basic reproductive number. It's the effective reproductive number for the very specific case, the very special case, the very important case of uh, where we are surrounded by a sea of susceptibles. Because that deals with the, um, the most challenging case, the case that's most worrisome, right? Um, where the infection can move quickest. And we know it. Um, it's less and less efficient transmitting uh, after that. Okay, so the effective reproductive number is this number of individuals infected by an index infective, a sort of single individual infective um, over the, um, uh, the, the context of their, their illness, okay? Um, and it depends on C, the contact frequency, people per unit time with whom they have contact, the transmission probably beta, the length of time they're infected, and the fraction of susceptibles. And as I said, from an individual perspective, the bug will be spreading if the effective reproductive number is greater than one. I'm going to replace myself with two infectives by the time I recover. And so the number of infectives will be rising, let's suppose. Or I reflect, replace myself for something like measles. You can get uh, the basic reproductive number, which is the effective reproductive number in the context of 
a totally susceptible population being something like 16 for a place like England and Wales. Um, so each, each infective gives rise to 16 other infectives by the, the, uh, the time they recover. Um, and uh, for COVID, for the conventional strain, again, it's somewhere, somewhere somewhat upwards of, of three um, for, for our province. And uh, in other cases, um, uh, like with other strains, it, it may be uh, significantly higher, higher yet, uh, something upwards of four. Um, by contrast, if the effective reproductive, reproductive number is less than one, the number of cases should fall over time. Um, and it turns out for those of a mathematical bent, um, you can also uh, formulate uh, and derive the effective reproductive number using what's called the next generation matrix as, a, as an eigenvalue. Um, it's, it's related to the largest eigenvalue, okay? Um, and particularly if the largest real eigenvalue is, is uh, is uh, greater than zero, the bug will be, will be spreading. Um, now, the basic reproductive number, as I said, is the same as the effective, but it's when, when that infective, that index infective is surrounded by, you know, entirely susceptible people. And it's of key interest because if it's less than one, the bug's not gonna get started. Um, this is the most difficult case. And if it's less than one, it's not gonna get out of the gate. And you'll notice that um, the initial speed of rise is proportional to this quantity. It's e to the, to the basic reproductive number minus one uh, divided by the, uh, the length of infection tau um, times t. This is actually the uh, serial interval, I think. Um, between generations, but it's it's basically very similar to tau, um, and and this is uh, over time. So you can actually empirically measure based on um, based on seeing curves for how the bug is spreading uh, within a given population. You can get some estimate of the basic reproductive number, but that hinges on some assumptions, and one of them is that, for example, all infections are reported. For something like measles or chickenpox, that's probably not too bad an assumption. Um, for something like COVID or TB or chlamydia or gonorrhea, um, that's not so great an assumption. Um, okay, um, right. Um, so a, a little bit more on the basic reproductive number. Um, so. If we consider the basic reproductive number um, within some assumptions, basically at a given time, the, the effective reproductive number uh, will often be, uh, be well approximated as F, the fraction of susceptibles in the population times uh, this basic reproductive number. And it kind of stands to reason, right? Um, this isn't always true for all models, but it, um, it relates to uh, this definition back here. I said that the effective reproductive number was C times S over N times beta times tau. The basic reproductive number was that, but with S equal to N. So this was, was one. Um, F, is just the, the fancy term, the fraction of susceptibles for S over N. So yeah, I mean, uh, the effective reproductive number is the basic reproductive number times F. Um, the basic reproductive number essentially assumes S equals N. And so this term is one. Um, okay, so uh, this is, but it, it brings out, this is a key throttle. Um, the the fraction susceptible uh, directly impacts uh, how many how many uh, how many secondary infective infections a, a given infective can cause by, for, before they recover, um, and this is going to be a central point of understanding for the phenomena we'll be seeing shortly, particularly in the context of 
two cases we'll be looking at. Number one, for the case of an open population, okay, where we have, think something like measles uh, pre-vaccination, where we have kids being born every year, there's a big outbreak, kids uh, from, you know, older, um, uh, older ages up to 10 down to one are, are infected. Um, but then there's not enough wood to sustain the fire that measles goes into abeyance for the next several years. But you have kids being born all through that time and the number of susceptibles is building up. Um, here, uh, in that case, uh, this S over N, the, the fraction of kids that are susceptible is going to be a key, a key uh, throttle in whether the infection can spread efficiently amongst kids. Now, beyond this, um, we also see this uh, being of central interest in the case of loss of immunity, um, where we have people uh, uh, who, who can lose immunity after some time, either due to, say, viral mutation, pathogen evolution, uh, or, or because their immune system um, uh, just doesn't retain long-term immunity. Something like pertussis is a good example where you uh, are recommended to get at least six shots uh, through your younger life um, to protect you and protect others against infectious. Even, even for parents um, uh, having their first child uh, suggested to get a pertussis shot to cocoon the child, for example. Um, okay, um, so um, I wanna, I wanna um, rehearse a little bit of, of um, understanding that's gonna be key for the analysis we're going to be examining in coming minutes. And um, one of them concerns the use of uh, derivatives to reason about cases where quantities aren't changing. We're gonna, this is gonna be central when we look at equilibria in a few minutes. Um, but I'd like to ask, what's the, the maximum count of infectious cases? Where does that occur? We saw it last time. And if I had uh, planned appropriately, um, I would have had this slide before that one. But we saw that the number of infectious uh, individuals rises over time exponentially uh, and it peaks uh, and then declines. And I argued that this peak in infectiousness was not the same as, it didn't coincide temporarily, it wasn't contemporaneous with the peak in the number of people, the, the rate at which people are getting infected because this peak reflects a stock and flow dynamics where, which considers not just people getting infected but also people recovering. Um, so what's driving that? Well, I is that red curve. And if I dot equals zero, what is that telling us? What does this mean that we're solving it? Um, if, if we say I dot equals zero, where in this diagram will I dot equal zero? If the red is I, where will, where will the rate of change of I be zero? Anyone? The peak? Yes. At the peak? It's, it's, it's not going up, it's not going down. Remember I dot is how quickly it's going up, right? If it's positive, it's going up. If it's negative, it's in decline. Here, it's zero. And that's gonna be at exactly this time where it's in stasis. It's not rising, it's not falling. Uh, the, the water's coming into the bathtub quick, just as quickly as it's leaving. So um, uh, I'm going to solve this equation for that, this is uh, I is has people coming into it um, from from susceptibles. That's this inflow, and then it has people going out of it from recoveries. And I, I call this mu. In other cases, I'll call it tau. I, I wanted to standardize around tau, but I neglected this slide. Um, now we could solve this to try to solve the um, uh, the, the conditions at which. Uh, this peak occurs. And uh, if, we, if we do so, um, if we assume I is not zero, we can divide by I on both sides and solve for S. And what we'll find is that uh, S um, 
will the, the fraction of the population, uh, if we consider S over N, N is just the S plus I plus R in this case, the, the whole population is divided into susceptibles, infectives, and recovered. The fraction of the population um, uh, at which this will be uh, equal to zero is I over C beta mu, okay? Now, does anyone recognize C beta mu? What is that? I, I, I positively shouted it at you a few minutes ago, um, but I, I, call, I referred to mu as tau. What is this? What's that quantity? C beta tau, let's call it tau. Let's call this tau, okay? Um, what's C beta tau? It's something very intuitive. It is the... The basic reproductive number. Yeah, it's the basic reproductive number. That's the basic reproductive number. That's the number of people that are given infective infects before they recover in the context if they're totally surrounded by susceptibles. So that basic reproductive number comes out in dictating the fraction of susceptibles, the fraction that are susceptible at the time that the, uh, that the infection reaches its peak. And if you think back to my words earlier, it kind of makes sense because that's, that's the fraction of susceptibles when this peak occurs. So if this is the peak in infectives, that will be this fraction of susceptibles. Now, and I said, this peak occurs when, as an infective, I infect fewer, well, you know, I infect one person exactly before I recover. In other words, the, I, I just replace myself uh, with, a, with a given person. Normally, I, I would have affected, back here, if I had been an infective, it would have been, uh, you know, it, it would have been, you know, trivial to, to infect people. I would have infected, how many people as an infective, how many people would I infect uh, at the very beginning? I'd infect how many by definition? At the very beginning, I'm surrounded by susceptibles. How many people am I going to infect on average? The contact rate. It's, it's certainly dependent on the contact rate. That's a good uh, put. Put the names into the, the chats. I want to give you folks brownie points. Um, uh, yeah, don't 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 lie about sneaking up too. Um, don't don't flood it with you know everyone's name a hundred times or something. Um, give credit where credit's due. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, so contact rate has a lot to do with it. But what um, would be the Basic reproduction yes, number. Yes, yes, yes. At the very beginning of time, each infective infects, you know, a number of people equal to the basic reproductive number before they they recover. At this point, they're just infecting one person. And what what's the relationship between the beef, uh, the effective reproductive number and the basic reproductive number? Is just this this term S over N, it's the fraction of the population that's, that's susceptible. Um, so in other words, the effective reproductive number for many models is just F times the basic reproductive number where F is the fraction of people that are susceptible. So it stands to reason that this fraction um, at which this is at a peak where I'm infecting just one person before I recover is one over the basic reproductive number. At that point, take a look at it. S over N will be one over the basic reproductive number. So one over R0 times R0. By the way, this is also commonly called R0 because zeros are called not in Britain. Um, uh, they're also called not in Australia, although they also call them bugger all, um, which is weird. Um, but um, moving right along. So this is one over R zero times R zero uh, and it equals one, right? It's at, uh, it's at that point that I infect just one person before I recover. And in order to achieve that, the effective reproductive number has to be one and therefore it has to be um, 
you know, we have to have a fraction of susceptibles, of susceptibles that's one over the basic reproductive number because the effective reproductive number is just F times R zero, the fraction of susceptibles uh, times R zero. Okay, um, so um, uh, there we are. Um, that's, uh, that, that it's at that um, condition that the, that the infection peaks. And this is gonna be key because we're gonna see these peaks, um, maxima and minima occurring for our recycling population in just a few minutes um, that occur at those same conditions. When the effective reproductive number equals one, if we're on our way down, that's when the, the infection is gonna continue to decline after that, because we're not gonna even replace the, those who are recovering. Um, by contrast, if we tip that, if we hit it on the way up, it's at that point, it's gonna start growing. Um, but it's in stasis at that point. Now we're gonna use phase spaces or state spaces as useful depiction mechanisms. And I wanna introduce them. Uh, gotta watch time here. Um, in a state space diagram, we're going to abstract away from time. Normally when I show you these, these plots, you have time on the X axis. This after all is a course in dynamic modeling, but there's a very useful way of depicting dynamical systems other than that, that has a different diagrammatic mechanism. Time is there, it's simply implicit, okay? There's no axis for time. The axes are instead devoted to the different state variables of the system. In this case, number of susceptible, number infective, and number uh, recovered, okay? Um, this was, this was gonna be immune there. Um, and here we can depict at any one time, the system will be a certain, at a certain place in this trajectory. Now this trajectory, mind you, it, it's location. The coordinate is given at that time, how many people in the system are susceptible? How many people in the system are infected? How many people in the system are recovered, that will dictate the location of this dot. And over time, as the system evolves, the number of susceptibles, let's say, declines, um, it'll be moving along. The number of infectives maybe is going up. And so it's moving mostly kind of this way, but somewhat this way. And the number of recoveds is going up. So it's also, um, it's also rising. So it's gonna move along in kind of a parametric way along this. Time is implicit here. There's no time axis. It's just kind of playing out. And you'll notice that here, it, you could sometimes have these dynamics by which it spirals in in this, um, uh, in this sort of trajectory. Now, I could go on for days about these, uh, these state space plots. They're incredibly insightful. And it turns out that that you can, when you create these state space plots, you can often learn about the intrinsic dimensionality of the system. It's intrinsic structure in a way that allows you to build better models of it. It can clue you into the fact that uh, if you look at empirical data um, related to this, uh, that, that you need a model that needs to have additional stocks, for example, or needs to incorporate additional representation of delays. Um, it can actually clue you in, whisper to you about what sort of model you need if you look at empirical data like this. Um, but here we're looking at results from a, a simulation model. Okay, so these state space diagrams depict uh, what we call the state space. Each point here completely delineates for this diagram, the state of the system, right? Number of susceptibles, number of infectives, number of recoveries. Um, and we're just characterizing how that evolves over time. Um, that's in contrast to a time plot where we might have three different curves, one for susceptible over time, one for infective over time, and one for recovered over time. Here, it's all in one trajectory, and time is sort of running along um, uh, as we proceed along that trajectory, okay? Um, okay. Um, so... Something like this might be depicted with a state space plot like this. So here we have, you know, some 
number of people that starts very low for infectives and then it rises, but, but susceptible starts high and, and then comes down. And here, if we have a state space plot in two dimensions, um, we have susceptibles uh, start high and whoa, infectives start low, that's this axis. So we're starting here and we can actually create using software like uh, Maple or, or like uh, Mathematica, we can create these diagrams with systems of equations to kind of map out if I were here, where would I go? These are flow lines for the differential equations. And you know, if I were here, I'd follow along and flow along here. Um, in this case, I start at 1500 uh, susceptibles roughly and, and, uh, and one infective and I start proceeding. What is it telling me that I'm going up at this angle here? What, what is that telling me, uh, the angle here? What is it telling me about how susceptibles is changing and effectives is changing? Anyone? Susceptibles are decreasing while infectives are increasing. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yes, exactly right. So, so as we're heading up, um, you'll notice that we're going up and so infectives are increasing. We're, we're getting at larger numbers there. And susceptibles are meanwhile decreasing. Um, we're, we're, we're you know, moving to the left the further we go up. And so here we're, we're sort of uh, having fewer susceptibles. We're draining susceptibles. We're uh, boosting infectives. And it rises to a certain peak when we have um, fewer susceptibles um, and uh, a maximum number of infectives. And then it turns around. And what does it mean if it's going down this way? Anyone? We run out of susceptibles? Yeah, we, we're running low on susceptibles. The wood in the fire is, there's less and less unburnt wood, right? Um, there's a little, bits and pieces here, still a bit of kindling left over, a bit of that, that log that isn't burnt. But it's, um, we're, we're, we really don't have a lot of unburnt wood. And so it's getting harder and harder for each infective to infect anyone. Um, maybe you don't think of it that way, but um, it's useful intuition. And the number of infectives is also dropping. And, and why is it dropping? Well, again, I mean, Infectives is going to drop if what? Under what conditions will the stock of infectives drop? If inflow is less than outflow. Yeah, if inflow is less than outflow. And outflow here is recovery, and inflow here is just dictated by, oh, where's my diagram? Um, is just dictated by incidence. And so by, by new people getting infected. So if recoveries are occurring faster than people are getting infected, new people are getting infected. We have 10 recoveries per day and only five new infections. We're gonna end the day with fewer infectives than we started, right? Um, uh, and that's what's occurring there. And then it plummets down to, you know, a, a resid small residual number of susceptibles and um, a, um, uh, you know, and, and essentially it goes extinct with zero, zero infectives because they can't replace each other, you know, uh, quick enough to, to keep it going. Um, and the fire kind of peters out. Um, infection, you know, here, um, okay, for a, for a separate case, if we have the basic reproductive number less than one initially, the number of infectives will, may start at one, but, you know, it's, it's essentially going to drop. And, in a differential equation, we treat it as, uh, you know, a fractional thing. You could think of this in a way as what's the probability there's still even one infective if, if you if it prefers if you prefer to think about you know a half a person in that context, fifty percent chance that person is still infective, but the infection can can decline immediately. So here we might start with fifteen hundred people susceptible, and if the bug is such that because of the amount of people are wearing masks, they're washing their hands, so beta maybe is low, they're social distancing, um, uh, but maybe they're not going out of their homes as much, they're not attending those gatherings, uh, C is low. You might have a situation where um, C times beta times tau 
Um, the number of people they infect before they recover, remember C times beta is the number they infect per unit time and multiplied by tau, you get the number they infect before they recover where that could be less than one. And in that case, the, the number of, of susceptibles is gonna decline somewhat. Maybe you get you know chance transmission to one or two people, but it's gonna peter out. Um, and the average number of infectives is, is going to, to decline. So here, you know, you might get a few people infected, but it's, it's gonna peter out. Um, so under what uh, conditions is it, uh, okay. Um, so we, we talked about this, the, the individual perspective and the aggregate perspective on why I is declining individual each infective is infecting fewer than one person before they recover over the course of their illness. In other words, uh, from an aggregate perspective, outflow is, is um, uh, um, uh, yeah, mumble. Um, uh, so, so there, um, okay, um, fixed. Um, so the outflow is greater than the inflow, right? Um, uh, so uh, here we're going to have um, people recovering uh, faster than they, they're, they're getting infected. Um, okay, so these were the underlying equations associated with this. Uh, sorry, we've got a local audience here too. Um, and um, we have, um, these sort of equations, we're gonna be looking as we get a population which has people coming in. We've been assuming it's zero thus far. And um, I wanna solve for this special case before we get on, go on to the general cases of, of people coming in and people losing immunity. I wanna talk about um, uh, finding equilibria. The equilibrium here will be particularly simple. It'll be particularly trivial as it were, particularly, um, and particularly sort of uh, um, fundamental. Um, so we have these equations, they should be familiar to you and you should know the, the intuition associated with them. This is a first order delay. This is our standard, standard equation and you should know the reasoning behind it. Um, I'd like to ask, when is this system in balance? Under what conditions will this system not be changing, be just in total equilibrium? Um, S is not changing, I is not changing, and R is not changing. What, what would S dot, I dot, and R dot all have to be if this system is not changing? They'd have to be what value? Zero. Zero. They'd all have to be zero. They're not going up. They're not going down. They're staying the same, right? I have a bad habit of looking at where your pictures are rather than at the the camera. So I'm going to uh, try to uh, try to adjust adjust this. So this is in balance when s dot and i dot equals zero. Okay. Um, and I, I don't know if this got cut off or no. It, it should have said equals zero here um, on the right hand side. S dot e s to equal zero and i dot s to equal zero. And you know we can solve that, right? If if this thing up here is equal to zero. We can go through and, and solve what must uh, what must I be um, um, associated with this uh, if we assume, for example, um, uh, that that we have no change uh, associated with uh, with s, and these are these two parts of the equations. This first one is from the top one. Um, we also have to have this one be true, and if you solve it. Um, uh, what you'll what you'll end up finding is that um, i is equal to zero uh, is is when it's in balance. Um, it's in balance then because well think about it i equals zero will mean that this first this term here for s dot is zero right and so s dot will be zero okay and i dot will be guess what zero because i is equal to zero. So when I equals zero, both these terms will be zero. It'll be in stasis. And because R here is just nothing more than uh, the total population, sorry, total population minus 
S minus I, it's just the rest of the population. If I is not changing and S is not changing, R will not be changing, okay? Um, so, um, so we don't even have to separately uh, solve for that. So um, this is a particularly simple case. It's, it's a case that we basically have one equilibrium um, uh, that's of, of primary concern. And that will be where we have I being zero and S being the entire population. Uh, it's not going to change. It's just going to stay like that. Um, now, in fact, if you add it kind of halfway, half people recovered and half people susceptible and just, and no one infected, that would also be an equilibrium. Um, in general, um, uh, when we're looking for equilibrium, we're looking for this condition where all of these rates of change, S dot, I dot, and R dot, which are just shorthands for ds dt, di dt, dr dt, in other words, the rates of change with respect to time of each are equal to zero. That is our equilibrium condition. Please, 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 please remember that for the final exam, okay? Um, that's the equilibrium uh, condition. And what we're going to be doing in coming minutes, if I don't watch out, it'll be coming seconds, is um, going through a set of examples and, and solving for each equilibria. But when we solve for equilibria, we're solving conditions under which it will be in balance. That doesn't say that the balance is stable. Um, you know, there may be certain types of balances that are, are, are sort of metastable. They're, they're, they're only stable, you know, um, uh, in a very tenuous way and even a, a gust of wind would blow it over, right? Um, and we've all encountered situations like that um, where it's, you know, any slight disturbance will just knock it over. Um, so technically it's not moving, but it's just waiting for an accident to, to happen. And, you know, in a, in a normal teaching context, I would have been in 320 and I would have, you know, had a nice little example, but something like this, right? Um, this thing is, is balanced, but it's not stable. Um, and even more so here, but I'm not gonna tempt fate. Um, so this is, this is in an equilibrium. Well, oh, okay. Uh, this is in an equilibrium. Uh, okay, well, uh, fate conspires. It's, it's in equilibrium, but yeah, um, you get the point. It's not a stable equilibrium. And in general, we're interested in trying to understand stable, a stability too, because we want, we want a resilient system. We want a system which, is, which won't be knocked off kilter if one example of a variant comes into the province or someone flies in with, um, with you know, TB um, into the, the airport. We want a system that can respond to that and put a lid on it quick. Um, okay, um, we're gonna talk about two examples here and these are going to be exemplars um, for the sort of, um, uh, the sort of uh, examples you'll be asked to solve in some cases, okay? The first concerns this case about which a student asked last time in office hours. It's a case of an SIR model, but we stick an S at the end to indicate that people can become uh, susceptible again after being recovered. So it's as if you had, and I apologize, I don't have a nice diagram to show it, you had SIR, but there's a loop back, a flow back from recovered back to susceptible, okay? Um, by which people after a certain amount of time uh, will, will lose immunity and return to susceptibility, okay? Um, and uh, that's what we're gonna be, be looking at here, okay? So um, there's this constant, we'll call it omega, that relates to this waning of immunity. I think it kind of looks like a W for wane, right? Um, so this is gonna be a chance per unit time. This is just a first order delay, right? This is a chance per unit time 
that someone's going to go from recovered state back to susceptible state. They're coming out of recovery, so they're out of the recovered state, so it's a minus sign here and a plus sign there, just like this has a minus here and a plus here, or minus here and plus here. So remember, flows here um, have two terms associated with them. If they're one for the stock they flow, out of which they flow, whence they come, and one for the stock into which they flow, whither they go, right? Um, so this is our waning term. And maybe, you know, it's um, some small value per day. For something like COVID, um, that uh, city in, in Amanos uh, from Brazil, um, they were uh, infected by COVID seven or eight months ago at devastating levels and have been reinfected terribly. Um, for COVID, you know, I'm not betting on anything much more than six months immunity. And that has implications for vaccination, as you can imagine, because like we're going to finish vaccinating the population the first time through and have to think about a second round, just like you get annual flu shots. Um, uh, so here, we're going to take advantage of the fact that, look, uh, yeah, there's R, but but the, the whole population is closed. It, it, we have, we have um, uh, are just being what's left over from uh, of the whole population from S and I. So we, we really don't have to treat this separately as long as we know the dynamics for S and I. If we know they're not changing, we know R isn't changing because R is just the rest of, of the population. And that, that can't be changing without S or, or I changing. Um, there's a conservation of people if you prefer to think of it in that language. Um, so we're gonna be looking for a case where S dot and I dot are both equal to zero simultaneously. Neither is changing. S dot equals I dot equals zero. If, you, if, if that makes it nice to think about. Both are zero. Um, and that will tell us that R dot is, is equal to zero since R is just subtraction of those two. Um, okay, um, so, uh, so here we have uh, just focused in on at the formulas for uh, S and I. All we've done is we've, because R is N minus S minus I, we've just sort of plugged that in. So we don't have any residual references to R, this weird R variable. It's just R simply is this. N is constant. It's, a, it's the total population. Okay, great. Um, at least I think it's great. Um, okay, so... Uh, we want to solve this for uh, S dot equals I dot equals zero, um, which will imply S dot, uh, uh, R dot equals zero. So let's, let's uh, try to go at this thing, right? Um, if, if, let's focus on this equation. We set this equal to zero. And, um, you know, we're going to solve for, uh, for this equation, we're just factoring I out in front, right? And multiplying both sides by N. So we, we don't have to deal with these pesky fractions anymore. So we're gonna multiply this whole thing by N and pull the I out in front. And we're gonna get C times beta times S uh, times, um, in, in the I's out in front, minus uh, here the, um, oh, we're multiplying by tau as well. Yeah, tau, tau and n to get rid of the fractions. Um, so a tau ends up here and n ends up here. And, and then we're going to have two cases. And this is very common. Man, if you learn this, you're going to do well on the final exam, OK? It, this is extremely common that we have two cases, one where i is going to equal 0, one where it's not. If i is not equal to 0, what can we do here? to solve this then for S. If we know I is not equal to zero, what can we do? Anyone? Why, why would it be nice for us to know that N is, or that, sorry, that I is uh, not equal to zero? If it's not equal to zero, what can we do on both sides? And then you can divide the I out. So, divide by I, and then all we can do is solve for S in terms of these other, other quantities. And uh, then we can end up using the other equation to solve for i um, in, in terms of s. Um, by contrast, if i equals 0, well, that tells us a lot. 
uh, about I, and we can end up uh, leveraging that. So we're going to look at that case first. So here we're going to say, okay, suppose I equals zero, right? Um, well, okay, in this case, look, um, uh, it, we have, um, we're going to be, if we, we consider the, the S dot equals zero, this is just the equation for S dot equals zero, right? Um, I is equal to zero. So this term entirely goes away. So we know, and, and this term I goes away. So we know uh, omega times N minus S, um, this is just the number of people in the population who are, who are uh, recovered essentially since I is zero. Um, uh, equals zero, if, if we're assuming uh, omega is not equal to zero, we just divide it through. So, so S equals N. So, so this case says S equal to N, I equal to zero, S equals N came out of this. Uh, the only way this could be true for any omega is if S equals N. So S equals N, I equals zero. That was what we assumed. Uh, as one of these two cases for, for solving this, because uh, it certainly solves this. And R is equal to uh, N minus S minus I, since S is N, we get zero. So, so this is one solution. What is this telling us? What is this solution telling us? Can anyone in a, you know, a sentence or two just describe what's the case here? What does this case describe? Everybody in the population is susceptible. Yeah, everyone's susceptible. In that case, it'll be imbalanced, right? If everyone's susceptible and I is zero, this is going to be, these terms are going to be zero. Um, this term is going to be zero. And nobody's recovered. So this term is not going to have anything there. And so it's going to be imbalanced, sure. Um, now, whether it's a stable balance is going to depend on the basic reproductive number, but we're not going to get to that right now. The other case, though, is the endemic equilibrium. That's a case where I is not equal to zero. Okay. Now, in this case, we're going to need to, we can divide both sides by, by I. We'll get C beta S tau equals N, which implies that S equals this quantity. Um, and uh, ooh, uh, 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 mumble, uh, uh, ignore the S here. Ignore that S, okay? Um, uh, mumble. Uh, okay, so ignore this S in the denominator. Uh, that, that shouldn't be, that's a wayward S, okay? Um, so this is N divided by C beta tau. Does anyone recognize that C beta tau? What is that? R naught. Yeah, that's R naught. That's the, that's the uh, basic reproductive number. So what this is telling us is in the endemic equilibrium where we have people, for the case where we have people losing immunity over time, becoming susceptible again, there's also a resting point where the system's in balance. Nothing is changing where S equals the fraction of the population that's, that's uh, susceptible is just one over the reproductive, the basic reproductive number. Um, because this is the fraction of the population that's that's susceptible. It's it's uh, you know one one reproductive number of the population, right? Um, one over the reproductive number uh, of the population. Again, sorry for that uh, wayward S there. Um, now um, that's S. Now we we need to solve for I. Uh, so so this is told us what S is at this, at this equilibrium. Now we need to go solve for I. And so, you know, it's back to the salt mines, right? Um, so we know S dot equals zero. So look, we know, we know what S is. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, I don't know uh, why that, uh, that, that S is, it's like the bane of my existence. It followed me through to that. I was doing this about midnight last night. So um, it shows. Um, uh, and uh, and we can we can go through here, and I think this is uh, this is correct though that um, uh, we're going to get uh, this circumstance here. That's right. There's no uh, there's no S's here, so I correctly took that into account. Um, and uh, and solving basically we we could solve um, for it in terms of of this. So what do we do? We basically look substituted in this constant 
can't ignore the S, for S here. And we solve this for what? What did we solve it for? We solved it for I, right? Um, if we substituted in this constant for S, N over C beta tau, um, all we have left is some function of I equals zero, right? Um, and, uh, and we can solve that. All the other things are just parameters. N, C, beta, um, and tau. And so we could solve for I, and that's what we're doing here longhand, and I kind of did it out for you. Um, and, uh, and so uh, you can go ahead and, and, and solve for it, and you'll find this. And uh, we are assuming here that, um, um, that, that this thing um, uh, is, is, is non-zero non um, in solving and inverting it here. But basically, you get this formula. And so the overall thing you get, if we phrase it in a vector notation, is as follows. Um, we solved uh, for S first, and then we solved for I, and then R is the rest of it. It's just everything else. Um, and you'll notice that everything here is, <laughs> I was gonna say everything here, everything here, ladies and gentlemen, is nice. And it is, but it may escape your immediate notice and appreciation. Um, but one of the things that makes it nice is um, that all of these terms, which you'll see, um, uh, can be recognized as being of, of unit dimension, okay? Um, and uh, we have things like omega tau. Omega is this rate of waning immunity. Tau is an amount of time that someone stays infectious before recovering. If you multiply them, you get something of unit dimension. You have something that's a dimension one over time times something of dimension time. Um, and C beta tau is just the uh, basic reproductive number um, uh, as well. Um, this is a, a familiar quantity. And uh, this is the fraction of the population that is susceptible in this equilibria. And you get, you know, the, the infectives uh, are that times this quantity. And it starts to um, lend itself to some appreciation here. Uh, for example, as uh, C goes up, um, what will tend to happen is that we will have uh, a smaller fraction. So if we have higher rate of contact, we'll tend to have fewer people left over susceptible in the population. Um, we'll have more people who are, when I say leftover, more people, fewer people that are at any one point susceptible in this equilibrium. We'll have more people who are infective at any one point and more people that are recovered at any one point. But it's not just C by itself, it's really C beta. Every time, every time a C appears here, a beta appears. It's really C beta that's the operative thing here. C is not so much the, the primary driver, it's, it's C beta that, that, that is. And as you'll see, it's actually C beta tau. It's this basic reproductive number um, that's sort of this, this kind of nice, um, nice um, uh, quantity. So, um, you know, I make some, um, some comments to this. Uh, you'll notice uh, omega tau is the ratio, for example, of active infectives compared to recovered. So as we have a higher rate associated with losing immunity, it will tend to people to spend less time in the recovered stock before they go back to the susceptible stock and can be re-exposed and gotten infected again. Apologies for the English. And so what that will lead to is it will boost infectives relative to recovered. And the ratio between them is omega t. So the, the larger the value of omega, or actually just, just better to say the larger the value of omega t, the, um, uh, the, the larger, larger the fraction of the population that's actively infective rather than sitting in that recovered stock. That kind of makes sense, right? People are circulating back sooner. And after all, tau is how long they spend infected before they recover. Um, 
So if tau is longer, yeah, they'll spend more time infected. Um, uh, similarly, we can we can reason some about um, the ratio uh, the ratio here, and um, you know by and large uh, we're going to have more people actively infected if we have people losing their infection sooner. You might think it would boost the fraction that are susceptible, but what it boosts most is we're we're just shoveling new wood into the fire here, right? We're 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 putting new wood in, and initially it's unburnt, but it quickly becomes burnt. Um, and, and that will allow the flames to remain very, very high. So, um, you know, you can get some insights by, by reasoning it in terms of this. I will note that if C beta tau is less than one, we're not going to have, this will be negative, right? Which wouldn't make sense, right? A negative number of people infected. Um, and that reflects the fact that the, the case where there's no endemic equilibrium, where there's no point of balance where the system has infected people in it still, um, uh, because uh, you know it's, it's C beta tau is it's less than one, it's going to just die down. So um, the endemic equilibrium only applies if the basic reproductive number is greater than one. In other words, it can initially spread in a totally susceptible population. It can spread. Um, so um, uh, that's uh, just a comment there. I think we've run out of time here, but next time I'm going to talk about infection dynamics in an open population. And we're going to go on and see how these cases um, sort of play out in dynamics. And what we'll see is oscillation and waves of infection, not terribly unlike some aspects of the waves of infection, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear viewers, that you have lived through in the past year. Um, we'll see Instead of uh, infectives sort of rising and falling and staying low, you can get them rising, peaking, coming down, then having a separate, separate wave, cresting, uh, going lower, and then rising again. And this is a reflection of the delays associated with the system. But understanding it is, um, gives rise to this deep appreciation for what's going on the role of the fraction of susceptibles that are um, that still remain in driving um, the infection and sustaining it. So that's all we have time for today. As I said, we will be holding office hours today at 3 p.m. rather than at 1 p.m. due to a, a meeting conflict that just came up. And I will hold those into after 4 p.m. if required to answer student questions, okay? Uh, let me know if that is a, a real need um, and I can stay some into the 4 p.m. time slot, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, I do have to repair to this meeting, uh, but I look forward to seeing some of you in office hours. I did post the new version of the problem or the new um, uh, correction to a problem set noting the time plot uh, as part of it and have tried to keep up with questions on the discussion group. Thanks very much. And I look forward to seeing many of you in two hours. Take care there.